happening yesterday in the market by Professor Saboda. Uh, my name is Davi and I'm part of ISP's Advanced Management Program team. On behalf of ISP, I welcome you all to the today's session. I would request you to put yourself on mute and type your questions in the chat or Q&A window. We will be answering uh, you, all your queries uh, you know, post the respective speaker's talk. Joining us today, Professor Subodha Kumar, uh, the eminent academicians who is the Paul R. Anderson Distinguished Professor of Marketing and Supply Chain Management at Temple University's Fox School of Business. Uh, Professor Kumar has been associated with, uh, uh, you know, with ISP for many years now, and he has been teaching in many programs, which includes uh, advanced management program in operations and supply chain here at ISP. His uh, research and teaching interests uh, predominantly include artificial intelligence, machine learning, blockchain, fintech, supply chain analytics, healthcare analytics, uh, and so on and so forth. So uh, also along with uh, Professor Kumar, I would also like to introduce you to Kanaraji, who is the Associate Director at ISP and leads the Industry Academia region at uh, the Manjal Institute for Global Manufacturing in the Indian School of Business. And uh, without no further delay, I would request Professor uh, to start the session. So what do you think? Should I get started or? Okay. Yes, Professor, you can start. Okay, okay. Okay, uh, thank you all uh, and welcome to the session. Uh, the goal here would be to give you a, some good idea of where this whole idea of operations and supply chain is going. And also I will touch upon uh, what is covered in this program. Um, and uh, since I have been associated as uh, Avi was talking about uh, with this program, as well as for ISB for more than 10 years. And then this program since uh, very first batch. Um, and then, um, uh, you know, it has gone through a lot of changes, but I believe that this program that we're talking here covers all the key aspects of business analytics issues that is coming in operations and supply chain. And I'll try to give you a glimpse of what is important right now, where we are going in next few years, what is very important for a country like India, but also at the global level, and what are the key issues and what are the key concerns that we need to solve. Uh, so let's start with understanding what are the current and future trends in operations and supply chain. Right? So uh, what happens here is that Forbes comes every year and, and some other agency, but Forbes one is quite reliable. And they try to put every year that what kind of technologies are at what location. Hyped is more like they're saying that it has not been there, but it has it is going to be promising has shown a little bit, but high ROI is one where uh, we start seeing more and more um, action already. Now, uh, the 5G is one thing that will change a lot of things in operations and supply chain, blockchain, and I'm going to spend time on that. That is not only the future of operations and supply chain, but future of many things uh, in, in the world. In fact, the whole industry is going to be built around that. But for operations and supply chain, it holds a very special place because we are already seeing a lot of useful applications. So we all need to see what, how would we resolve the issues related to blockchain? These are new problems. We haven't, we, we, we haven't seen them. Uh, we haven't resolved them. It's like, you know, you compare to how internet started in early nineties and uh, we could only see some web pages coming. But when Amazon started in 95, you know, the whole thing changed. And then we saw Netflix and, and, and other companies coming. So blockchain is kind of that stage right now. Since we are not seeing a lot of real action happening, we don't know the issues involved. So what I try to do at my center here at Temple is that um, I try to look at what are the emerging problems, what companies are already facing or they, they tend to face in next couple of years. Uh, another area which Forbes pointed out, which I totally agree is on AI and machine learning based platform. Uh, another big area in operations and supply chain is autonomous trucking. And it's very important. Now one can say that what in India would we really see autonomous trucking. See, Indian market is a little different in the sense that the cost structure in, in supply chain is very different. In US, the biggest cost is on, on drivers. Uh, the, the manpower is the costliest. In, in, in India, the biggest cost is fuel. Uh, so what would happen, the autonomous trucking also gets developed along with uh, electric trucks and so on. 
So in India, the lot of push right now is going on electric trucks, but we are going to see some autonomous trucking as well, maybe a little less than what we are seeing in the US right now. And then robotic process automation, which basically talks about how we can move a lot of stuff we are doing uh, that can move to that. And in fact, uh, you know, one very good company which came out of actually this program at ISB is called a company called Insight Z. Uh, and I have worked very closely with this company since it started. Go to the website of this company, you will find a lot of interesting application. Uh, one of the uh, alums from the program, Manish, uh, uh, along with few more people, in fact, there are two alums uh, who started. Now Manish is still uh, part of the founding team. And a uh, uh, lot of problem they are solving right now uh, is like based on robotic process automation across different industries, traditional manufacturing, railway service operations, and all those kind of things. So. Uh, that's the kind of thing we are talking here, solving the real world problem that is emerging. Don't look at the past, go look in the future. But we are not talking like science fiction's 20 years down the line. We are talking here something which is happening right now and which we'll see in next few years. A uh, lot of operational innovation is happening in healthcare supply chain. Now, don't think that healthcare is something just for providing healthcare services. A lot of operations and supply chain is involved in the process. In fact, a lot of quality of care as well as the cost depends on that how well you manage these operations and, and supply chain. So it's very important to understand. And I'll touch upon that. I know, uh, you know, I have on very tight timeline here, but I'll try to see how far I can go. I'll, I'll like to spend more time on answering questions, of course. But I will touch upon what we have recently done, what we are doing, where I think industry is moving, and what kind of problems we really need to start solving right away. We need to be proactive on that. For example, blockchain in healthcare. It, this is like, you know, you have to be there for drug counterfeit. And I'll, I'll touch on that in a few minutes. Uh, interoperability, traceability, trials, everywhere it is going. And it's all part of operations and supply chain. Uh, that's where we need to study that how uh, we can solve these problems. So when you think of the broad domain of business analytics, one set deal with how to deal with data and how data can tell us some interesting insights. And the second piece deals with how we can make decisions based on that. That's where the optimization comes into play. So, and, and you know, some of you will be more familiar than the other, uh, than these things. And I keep writing about this thing. I have been uh, uh, writing for last two, three years aggressively on, uh, what we need to do both in the academia, in the industry, how we can get together and solve what are the emerging problems. You can go and read some of these articles. Always go to my website. Uh, you know, you can use this QR code and you can find these articles. But I wanted to point out a couple of them, which I think is at the core of where business analytics is going. And I have also put my uh, uh, website link here so you can always... Uh, uh, you have easy access, but type my name, you will find it. Uh, you know, my name is a little unusual with an extra A in my first name. So it's very easy to find me on uh, Google or anywhere. Uh, also a couple of books that I have written recently, one had focused more on the digital marketing side of uh, operations and supply chain. Another I focused on social media analytics. Actually, this book is coming next month uh, in print. Uh, it's right now on Amazon. And I'll touch upon what we do in these two books and how it connects with operations and supply chain. So let's get started on different aspects of it. Um, I'll start with the biggest elephant in the room, which is very important is blockchain. I think for operations and supply chain management, if we don't look at that closely as a manager, as, a, as executives, you will be left behind uh, in this race. So what does it mean? I'll touch on that. Then I will talk about the, the variety of domains. And as I told in the limited time, I'll try to cover as much as possible. I cannot go into details of these things. And you can always find that from my website or write to me. I'll be more than ha happy to answer anything or, or respond to your um, emails later. So blockchain, okay. Why are we talking in, in operations and supply chain? You know, two years back, even before the pandemic started, uh, Walmart went all about it. They told that if you want to be my lettuce and spinach supplier, you have to join blockchain. And they gave a deadline of this January 2019 to them. Why start with lettuce and spinach? There is a reason behind it. A lot of E. coli and other disease come from uh, leaf products. And if you have a blockchain, 
uh, you can trace them very easily and you know where they are coming from. Whenever the problems come, you can isolate and also consumers know where they are coming from. So that was the thing. And, and, and you know, they did it um, quite aggressively. They also mandated some other uh, uh, companies in this one to go on blockchain. Now, those who know about blockchain, it can be implemented only if the whole chain is included in that whole supply chain, farmers, logistic firm, business partners, all the suppliers, they join. So they have been pushing hard on that. Now, how blockchain can reduce waste or fraud, for example, in, in uh, healthcare supply chain? So in pharmacy, nearly half of healthcare companies are developing blockchain, Novartis and, and Pfizer, all these companies have moved into that. And all members of supply chain would be involved, of course. And uh, this was not earlier possible with all the things we have, right? So blockchain is opening up new door. You know, I can tell you, in operations and supply chain, blockchain is going to be bigger than what internet did to us. You know, internet changed the whole world of uh, operations, right? We, you know, Amazon's came and all, it was not possible. Blockchain will be even bigger than that, the way it is developing right now. And every time I talk to somebody, you know, I get excited. I, I, I teach courses around blockchain at ISB, multiple courses and in, in this program, particularly I, I teach a couple of courses uh, around this idea. So it can reduce the risk of fraudulent drugs. It can, uh, it can go into also, it can provide all the answers to what happens to counterfeiting pharmaceuticals. Another place uh, where it is changing uh, blockchain in supply chain is automotive supplier payment. For example, Bajaj Electric went into uh, blockchain for all their payments okay so those are like more mundane and you can see that you know it's very easy to see you can create efficiency those are the simple ones but very powerful okay meat traceability now walmart had this intuition of all this meat problem going on in china and this all happened right before pandemic interestingly they started using blockchain to track sales of pork in china and they had implemented partly and it helped them a lot during the pandemic and so on and here they can see the whole chain um, of uh, meat. And they are planning to do that in other parts of the world as well. But they started with China because that's where the meat uh, uh, market was always a problem. Cold chain monitoring, that is changing like food and pharmaceutical products. They have uh, specialized storage needs. Um, and, and what they are doing, they are putting this temperature. Now think about it. You go and buy a drug and uh, or medicine, I mean, uh, you buy that and then medicine says that uh, you have to keep it at this particular temperature. How do you know that this medicine was really kept at that temperature throughout the supply chain? You have no idea to know. It's not an apple that you can see and say it's, it's bad, right? It's not banana. Medicine, I cannot know whether it has gone bad. So, and, and trust me, you know, it happens. Things go wrong in supply chain. So that's where the blockchains are coming. They take all the readings, they store on blockchain, and these things have been already implemented. These are not concept label. This has gone in practice. Um, and there's something concept of smart contract that uh, basically keep all the things if needed, they change the use by date and so on. So clearly the one of the big thing that will come here will be on uh, blockchain. And, um, uh, especially coming back to this this program, the content that you see in the program, you know, in fact, um, I gave you one example of Inside Z, which came out of this program. But I can tell you the many things that uh, is happening on the cutting edge. Uh, we all need to learn, and this has to be learned through proper process, and that's what we tend to do in many of these uh, courses around that. Uh, and you know, the whole idea of Learning these things is not to just know one or two things. Open up your mind and open up your eyes about these things so that how I can start implementing this in my company, how I can see the potential of these in my company. That's the basic idea. here, And that's what I will try to do today as well uh, in, in my remaining time, that I'll go through many different applications and show you what you do. Now, let's say I'm an executive. I say, yeah, blockchain sounds great. But what is the critical issue that I have not seen about blockchain? One of the biggest thing about blockchain is scalability. Scalability means that can I grow it at the fast pace? So blockchain has a problem that it stores data everywhere. Now that sounds very ominous or threatening because uh, uh, you know 
when, when the data is growing at this fast pace and it's stored everywhere, uh, then uh, how can we deal with it in the real time? So one of the first problems that we started analyzing is that how the scaling solutions work. Now, where do we get data on? We get data from Bitcoin, but, but I'm not interested that much into cryptocurrency as per se. My goal was to look at blockchain. Why we look at cryptocurrency then? Because that is the very first uh, uh, application of blockchain. So that's where we have data. So we collected this data and we tried to see how different scaling solutions work. And you can read the paper to get more. And, um, uh, you know, without getting into too much technicality in the blockchain, there are minors, there are delays and so on. And uh, then... Uh, they, in in twenty in couple of years back, they created a scaling solution in Bitcoin platform called Segwit. So we collected data on that, and and these are the transaction details from blockchain.com. You can collect from many other places. We collected data about 1.13 trillion dollar uh, transactions, and we tried to see how the scaling solution work. Again, as I told, I'm not going to get into technical detail, but this is the kind of problems we need to be solving as managers right now that where, what kind of blockchains can be done. Another place where blockchain is becoming very big in digital marketing or digital advertising. So this is another work uh, that I've been working with some company. So you have to realize that in digital advertising world, there's a lot of ad fraud. What ad fraud simply means is that uh, you pay money. So let's say somebody puts an ad on timesofindia.com. And whenever somebody clicks on the ad, the advertiser will pay money to timesofindia.com. Okay, or Times of India group. Now, what if there are bots who are creating fake uh, clicks? Okay, that is called ad fraud. So a lot of money gets wasted on that. Around advertisers are paying uh, around 16 billion annually on the fake ads, and that's why the blockchain started coming in this play. And there are a lot of middlemen there. They take money, and there are a lot of delays. So there are companies like. Um, uh, this edX, Edbank, uh, Lucidity, these are providing this solution. And companies like Toyota and all, they have moved their advertising to uh, blockchain already, most of the chunk of it. And many other companies are talking on that. So we look at many different aspects of that. We are working with some of these uh, blockchain providers and uh, we are trying to see that how this can uh, essentially uh, change the whole structure of uh, uh, digital marketing, operations in digital marketing. All of these are part of supply chain because when you think of digital marketing, you have a supplier of ad, you have an ad space, and then you have to match supply and demand. So a lot of these things that we talk about, analytics, blockchain, they are mostly about matching supply and demand and creating that gap into that. So it all comes into that domain. Another area where supply and demand is very uh, important and analytics itself is very important is in healthcare. Now, actually these projects are with ISB students uh, in another AMP program. And uh, they in fact got a couple of years, last couple of years, the base uh, capstone project. And this is with a company in Philadelphia that I work very closely. And we have, we are, we have collaborated with ISB in creating a lot of healthcare based, uh, a lot of solutions in healthcare domain using all this uh, AI and machine learning based solutions. Um, so first problem, we look at diabetic foot. Again, uh, without going into detail, we, we implemented a thermal image uh, a based solution. So rather than doing some process, you just take thermal image and do the thermal imaging of uh, the image analytics of that. And using that, you can say whether the foot is bad, what kind of treatment is needed. So all of these things that you see in these programs that we have utilized, um, going from deep learning and all again, as I told, I'll not get into details of this, but the key point I want to say that it can say that which features need further clinical interpretation um, and uh, what could be the proactive foot care, uh, what is the patient identification, all through thermal images, just take thermal images as I showed here. This is the kind of images that we have worked with and we have implemented it already um, uh, and uh, we, are, we are extending on that. But the initial work started with ISB students. So I really feel very proud on working with all the students at ISB. We have extended this work on uh, pulse wave data and brain wave data. So right now the brain wave data, we are working very closely with ISB students on that. Uh, this one was on pulse wave. 
uh, but brainwave one is in the early stages and we have got some very good results uh, uh, early on. So a lot of AMP programs get involved in these kind of projects that I work on. Another area in supply chain where it, it is quite important uh, to understand the um, supply demand part is shared economy. Now shared economy is everywhere. You know, Uber and Ola are just one part of it, but it is everywhere where uh, the, the, we are doing the Uberization of the economy where there are supply, there's a demand, you match them together, right? So uh, another set of work I work with is that how do you deal with driver's availability? How do you deal with demand? How can you change prices and wait time? And different countries have different rules. In, in some countries, you can bid for the price. In some countries, they are using the model where they will say that if you are in rush, you can pay more or you can pay lower but then you have lower chances of getting the car. All of those things are coming and we all have to understand what is the whole supply chain implications of that. So that's, that's another big area. Another area that, uh, that I think needs a lot of attention and I'm working closely with some of the companies is on industrial IoT based platform in maintenance service. What does that mean? So let's say the Boeing, uh, Boeing uh, has this maintenance service, uh, which is provided either by Boeing or third party. Now, what may happen is that um, uh, the Boeing is started creating this industrial IoT where even third party, their competitors can provide maintenance services. But what happens is that in the process, everybody can get benefit. So, so you know, it's very interesting. There's a word called co-optation where you compete with your, uh, uh, with your uh, competitors, but also partner with them. And industrial IoT is making that happen. So this is where fascinating area uh, that uh, we're working. Another thing that we keep missing in operations and supply chain is about cybersecurity issues. Now, you know, we are saying that everything should be talking to each other. You know, all pieces in the world in the supply chain should be talking. But interestingly, a lot of uh, ransomware attack, which is a kind of cyber attack, which is most common right now, happened on logistic company in supply chain. So all these containers and all companies, they got a lot of ransomware attacks in 2020 and 2021, even in 2019. So why they are getting attacked? You have to understand, they are containing all the supply chain data, where the item is coming from, where it's going. So if we don't talk about it right now, we can do all the, all the technology, IoT and, and, and machine learning, but we'll be in a mess because all our data will be stolen or, or first or ransomware attacks will happening. So I think that we ignored that, of course, large extent uh, because we were focusing on improving efficiency, reducing cost, uh, improving quality, but this is the right time. So I'm writing a couple of pieces on that uh, based on what I have been working with different companies. It should be ready to circulate in four or five months. I'll be more than happy. If anybody interested, you can go and look into that. Uh, and there are many other supply chain analytics issues that I, I, I work on. Again, I will touch upon each of them. Uh, one is, uh, is that uh, when you go to stores, you know, all these retail stores maintain their uh, inventory in database. But many times what the database shows mismatches with what is in the store. And there are many reasons for that. For example, you want to, you went to buy two different kinds of lace chips and they are different types, but the person who's scanning at the counter, they spent, they scan the same one twice to reduce time because they're same price. But in the database, it will all get mismanaged. Some people, some items get misplaced. Some items get uh, bad and thrown, but does not go into the database. So we are working with the one Spanish retailer and we, we look at how you can use analytics to solve this problem. Um, another one is that how you can be resilient. See, one of the big problem in supply chain during pandemic happened that we were not resilient. You know, I, I love these things when, when Wall Street Journal, New York Times, they're all big gung-ho about supply chain. You open the newspaper and the first thing you see is supply chain, right? Uh, but Wall Street came with something very interesting. Was it? No, it was Wall Street. They said that forget about everything. You have to learn about supply chain. Everybody in the world should start learning supply chain. Uh, you know, as a supply chain professor, what else you need? Uh, but uh, you know, jokes apart, I think this is the demand of the time that how we can make resilient supply chain. And this is what we do in this paper. Uh, also, so I have a lot of work on what you could have done differently in during pandemic, but more importantly, what do we learn so that we can do better in the future. You know, past is good to understand and analyze, 
but the goal is always to go into future. Another piece that is coming in global supply chain is national culture. So I look very closely on that. And, and there's some other work I'll, I'll not get into too much detail, but co-creation is another area which is very big. And a lot of my doctoral students work on that. Co-creation is something where rather than giving a project to your vendor, you work with them together. Okay? So you try to collaborate with them and try to find solutions based on that. Okay? So uh, this many companies are using that, like all uh, Siemens uh, and uh, Toyota, they have been working on a co-creation project. So I'm, I'm trying to get deeper into that, what role data analytics plays into that, how we can see the problems are different in co-creation than what we did in traditional supply chain. So we have to look supply chain and operations from a new lens. Just think about India, you know, uh, all this uh, big basket and all are coming with 20 minute delivery, 30 minute delivery. The way the item came after Amazon came into picture, they all changed the, the structure of supply chain. The, the, the uberization or, or shared economy, a healthcare where, where all the data is opening up right now, you have to start looking from the, the whole thing from a different perspective. And then the big elephant blockchain, right? Uh, another area that has got very little attention, this is my personal interest more than anything else, where I think a lot of uh, help is needed in sustainability and humanitarian operations. And I think that um, we, we have enough knowledge about operations and supply chain that, that we can apply here. So I work with a lot of NGOs and humanitarian organizations to see how I can help them. And, and I write about a lot of them because they also need a little bit awareness in the community. So one of the work we did in Houston with uh, Hurricane Group, and the idea was that when the hurricane comes, how you can do the pre-positioning of items because that's very important. And then we utilize the whole supply chain tool. Another thing is that uh, detection of environmental violators. Actually, this was the project uh, of China government. And what really happened in this project is that, and, and you can see that the, it was a government project, so there are people from government. And the idea here was that, uh, you know, a lot of people in China, in fact, a uh, lot of companies cheat about their, their environmental violations. It's a big problem in Beijing and all. And I think it's a very good learning for India as well. So industrial pollution is a big deal. They have some government policy, clearly that's not working. So they gave us this project that they collect this data called CEMS. They gave us this data set uh, and they told, can you create some machine learning based solution so that we don't rely on what they report but we can still find out what they do. So they do random inspection, but as you would expect, the companies know in advance, even though it's random, they know and they, they change things before somebody comes. So what we did, we took a very different approach. We created a tool based on this data called based on feature engineering and PU learning, which, is, uh, which are a uh, little bit newer things in uh, machine learning world, uh, but very uh, uh, getting very popular but not utilized in this context. So we, we took that idea. And the idea here is that even if they are cheating, using some other features, we can predict that they are cheating. Uh, so they report that they are not cheating, I'm all good. Uh, but I look at something else and do that to, to know that they are cheating. That is the idea of feature engineering. I use it for many projects, also for fake reviews. Um, I use a similar concept there. So you can read about feature engineering and these papers are all public. Um, uh, it's uh, public uh, uh, unit subscription, but uh, you know, if you're in ISB, you get all the free subscription anyway, but through other way also you can get it. Um, and then we did field test and so on. Another area, which actually this is the work done by faculty from ISB. We say that um, should the retailers allow the third party to refurbish, like should Apple allow the, the third party sellers to refurbish their item or not? Um, we also looked at another project where we say that um, all these companies uh, these days say that you can come. So let's say that uh, one, one very uh, uh, appropriate example is Patagonia. Patagonia is a company uh, which is basically sell the uh, clothing and other items. And But they also say that you can come and resell your old product to another person on my platform. So you cannibalize my own uh, sales but still they provide this. And the whole idea is to what is good for the environment. So they are big into environment. What we look at is that how you can maximize your profit as well as good for the environment. And I think, you know, this is a big thing right now in operations and supply chain to look at. 
Another area that, as I told, a lot of this is because of my interest. Um, uh, so uh, we are basically, we looked at this mobile pantries uh, and food bank. Food bank is a uh, very structured uh, industry um, uh, in the US. A lot of people basically live because of that and they get all the items, but they're not well managed. So I, I work a lot on that. In fact, um, in, uh, I've written a case as well as uh, uh, also uh, one of the papers we have written uh, and we work with one in Texas and but others also in North Carolina and Pennsylvania. So you can read about that. And finally, you know, many people don't realize a lot of uh, supply chain go goes into the actual notes and points. That's a big deal. And finally, how we can use social media. So there, there are a lot of things on that. Um, and and Prof, uh, Colonel Vargo, let me know whenever you want me to stop, I'll, I'll stop. Otherwise, I can keep going for two days. Uh, so uh, feel free to stop me at any point. Um, so another area which I think is very important in operations and supply, service operations, especially, is omnichannel retailing. Now, service operations is a big part of operations and supply chain these days because service uh, economy is getting bigger than all other economies. So we work with multiple retailers to look at many problems. Uh, again, you can go to my website, watch this NBC interview where we, we go into a lot of details of what I've been doing. Uh, but a lot of my work in service operations have been around looking at how these retail stores should manage their online channel. And one message is very important is uh, you have to treat your company as one company. Many companies deal their online channels separately than store channel and mobile channel. You can't work like that. You have to have a organized strategy where one strategy across different channels. And if you don't do that, you will be left behind. And then, then don't go and complain that Amazon ate up, right? Amazon is not eating everybody. These companies are just not efficient enough to deal with Amazon. If you can not do what Amazon is doing, you can't complain that they are eating us. So I'm I'm totally, it's not that I'm fan of Amazon or anything, you know, these are all unethical companies. I can go and tell this uh, on record and I have enough data to prove that. But what I'm saying is that they are doing some very smart things, which others are not following. So a lot of service operations work that I do goes into that, how to do assortment. And then of course, how to manage um, during and after pandemic. Another big area in the room in operations and supply chain is how to deal with your social media because that can impact the whole uh, supply chain as well. So we have done a lot of social media work is around online reviews that I see. And online managing your online reviews is a big deal right now. If you cannot deal with that, then you are in a mess. So we work with Yelp on this first project, which is like Zomato in the US. Um, and we say that how businesses owners can respond to the online reviews and what is the impact of that. And then a lot of my work is on how to detect fake reviewers. And we use feature engineering approach again. But one of the big question is that why not Amazon block all the fake reviews? They are a smart company. They have all the technology. Why don't they do that? And this, this question intrigued me for several years. Now, last year I started working on it that all these companies are hiding this uh, fake reviewer. You know, you can, you can get it very easily. You can get it at very low price and they are all open market. You know, if you go to dark net, I know you can find millions of them. So why they are not taking action? And then there, there are studies coming now showing that maybe it is good for Amazon not to block, block those uh, fake reviews. So in this um, research, we are looking what can policymakers do about that and if they can do anything and why is this happening? That's what we study the phenomena. And one of, one of the things that we did with the social media is that uh, we also wanted to look at influencer marketing. So we took this data from Indian general election 2014, and uh, we basically have tried to understand what is the impact of social media in the context of election. We extracted around 23 million tweets uh, of Indian election done by all the candidates, all the people talking about uh, election, and we did it between 2013, 14. We are replicating this, this for that, you know, negative tone, positive tone. I will, I'll, uh, leave you wondering that uh, who was the second most popular in social media in 2014 election. Of course, it was Narendra Modi was number one. That's not a surprise. Think about who was the second one. And I'll tell you, it was not Rahul Gandhi. So uh, uh, and, uh, you can read my paper to know more. Uh, we use different kind of analytics method there and, and you know some of the things that you will learn in the course. But um, 
One thing that I think is big in Indian context is influencer marketing. See, the forget about the web advertising and all. It all is being overtaken by social media marketing right now. And it is all about supply and demand, how you can cater to all the ads to the people they need. So I'll give you some example. If you look at the most followed Twitter account in 2018, they were not companies, they were individuals, okay? These are individuals, they were there. And uh, Ronaldo got 1 billion deal just for social media marketing, right on social media tweets, right? You see Sachin Tendulkar say, I'm enjoying Tata tea or whatever. They're all, all uh, uh, the influencer marketing. So I've, I've written a couple of papers, as I noted, and this book, actually, I go very deep into that. As I told, this is coming in print next uh, month, but I think on Amazon, you can already get that. Uh, we go into deep of where I think social media marketing is going to go in next few years and what companies need to do about that supply chain. Uh, and finally, I will end with healthcare operations. As I told, healthcare is a big deal uh, right now. Uh, and in healthcare operations, uh, this we worked with Vanderbilt Hospital in uh, Tennessee. And we did some operational changes using data so that you reduce the blood loss as well as uh, improve the efficiency of operation room. See, operation room is a big deal right now. And these are all new problems as you can see. I don't know how many of you are putting notes. This all came in this year. Most of the work I have talked right now is, is for, from, from the current year. And they, they're all, I believe, has a huge implication. In fact, uh, one of the surgeon uh, who is the head of uh, uh, surgery in uh, Jefferson Hospital in Philadelphia, which is one of the largest hospitals, he just looked at this paper and called me last week. And I told that we need to implement it. Jefferson's and talking to them. But in Indian context, it's very important. Another thing that, uh, again, this is for my interest, how we can use analytics to treat people. And this is the first time I went into the, the operational aspect of healthcare. I work with some big hospitals on, on cancer specialized hospital, and we created the personalized treatment plan for breast cancer, and we have implemented that. Again, it just came in print uh, last month. Um, and uh, this is a good example of where you can take operational uh, analytics that we all talk about and really do some change. Uh, and I, I also work with Fracto and we published this paper. This is based on Fracto. I hope many of you know um, in, in India. Uh, and we replicated this study for two Chinese online healthcare portals. So we learned from Fracto. We went to other portals in China. And then I'm working with the University of Washington Hospital in Seattle on what had been the impact of COVID-19 in telemedicine. How do we go from here? Uh, you know, Seattle is the one who started first in the US, so they have a variety of data. They actually asked us to look at this. I also look at something called Healthcare Information Exchange, which is big in the, big, which is coming big in India right now. So what it happens is that right now you go to different location, your data is stored there. In information exchange, you can pull data from each other. So you go to one clinic and you go here, you can pull data from each other. Uh, in India, actually, there's a concentrated effort. There's some government money has gone and some alums from IIM Bangalore and IIT Bombay and some ISB people, they've got together and they're working on some HIEs in India. And I have looked at series of work on that. If you go to my website, you can look at, these are all benefits, are they really there and so on. So you can, you can look at that. As I told, I can keep talking for four hours, but at this yeah. point, I will like to stop and, and give time for Q&A because I know Colonel Vargo has all the plans. Yeah. So let me stop yeah. here and, 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 and go from there, okay? Yeah, okay. Professor, I, I think this is mind boggling. If, I, if there's one word which I can use, the amount of, uh, you know, the productivity that you are having. And if I'm not wrong, uh, I think you are one of the global, uh, globally number one, uh, you know, writing in writing of research papers uh, in related to these topics. Uh, because I read somewhere that you are globally number one. I mean, this is a great achievement. And in fact, I will put it this way. Well, a lot of thanks way. to and lot of data, thanks to ISB. Lot lot of thanks yeah. to ISB and people like you. A lot of projects come from there. Right, right. In in fact, Professor, what I will say, if the data is the new oil, right, then the mileage that you are getting is much more than any vehicle uh, which get, gets from its oil. <laughs> right? Uh, so, uh, you have been coming up with some very great stuff. And if I'm also like to put across one thing for the benefit of the students is that, you know, quality dissemination uh, in the classroom 
comes only when there is a quality creation uh, by the faculty through their mind. So if there is a good amount of creation of quality, uh, when there is good amount of research, uh, then uh, what uh, is disseminated in the classroom is really one of the best. So uh, uh, I feel that there can be, uh, so uh, we are really privileged at ISB uh, to be, uh, you know, uh, listening to you and learning from you because the, all the research that you are doing is finally culminating into your, uh, you know, case studies and your uh, learn and your teachings uh, that you're doing at IA. Uh, so that is one. Uh, one thing I just wanted to, uh, you know, to talk, or rather two things uh, before we open up for questionnaire, is that, uh, you know, in India, a uh, lot of businesses, especially the MSMEs, they base uh, their decisions on biases and hunches. Right, a lot of hunch. So, do you feel that India is well primed to use data analysis uh, to overcome these biases and hunches and come up with something really worthwhile, which makes a difference? That's that's a very good question. So, I'll tell you two things. One thing, what happens is that the big change in India is happening right now. So when I started working in different domains, service operations, especially like, for example, healthcare, only 10% of the data was digital. But what I'm seeing, a lot of that is changing. Same in detailing, a uh, lot of data is becoming digitized. So even though we work on hunch, uh, at least many companies um, are moving towards big data. Now, a uh, lot of moms and pop stores, you know, small, small stores, they don't have that capability to a lot of data analytics and all. Uh, but what we need is what things like companies like Walmart and all did in the US. What they did was then they told that, see, I have capabilities, but I will go and train all my supply chain partners on that. And they did it in early 2000, a lot of that they are doing it now. So India has a lot of potential on that. I think uh, if we start using data, we can do wonders on that. Um, but the challenge is that how to get all the digital data right now. So we are we are in the transition phase right now, but there's a lot of uh, openness I have seen when I talk to different companies. There's a lot of demand on that. Uh, so next few years is going to be groundbreaking and changing in India and the use of data on different parts of operations and supply chain. So wait for that. I know that little behind on the curve is some part, but some part they are pretty advanced. Another thing you talked about some biases and all, right? Uh, we have to be careful when we go to machine learning and all, sometimes if the data comes with biases, uh, your previous decisions, sometimes you, it can get into your future decisions as well. So we have to make sure that um, we account for that. But I, I think uh, we can handle a lot of these things using data. Uh, yeah, thank you. I think that is a very nice answer. And uh, especially yeah. uh, I remember going through a very nice article uh, where uh, you'll be surprised that there is something known as a left digit bias, uh, where when we think that, uh, uh, you know, nine, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, they're all uh, left digit is one. The moment you go to 20, uh, things change. Something same like when you are age 59, you are young, and when you become 60, you are an old man. Uh, so uh, something like this, uh, uh, so there's a big, in the healthcare industry, there is a lot of, uh, I, I'm sure you're working on that also. Uh, so, uh, Professor, actually, I, we have with us one of our uh, uh, current uh, batch students, Rashmi, uh, who, who is a real fan of yours. There is no doubt about it. And uh, she has been uh, using, uh, you know, whatever it, what you have taught so far, she has really used it in a uh, business. So I think for the benefit of all our uh, potential students, we will request Rashmi to, you know, say a few words and maybe even put in a word to you. Yeah, and before Rashmit starts, I must tell you, Rashmit is one of our star uh, students and she has done a great job. And she really, uh, you know, shows that how you can get all this knowledge and apply that. And I hope all of you in the future do that. Okay, go ahead, Rashmit. Yeah. So when I came here, uh, I mean, that's the word I use, I'm a fangirl, because uh, I'm actually excited that our lectures are starting tomorrow for the next subject, Supply Chain Analytics, that you'll be te teaching, so. I'm extremely happy to you know be that but i thought it's a very right opportunity uh, to share what just recently happened so uh, 
after studying the curriculum from you professor in the first year residency we went ahead and i was finishing up parts of my research on supply chain control tars so in that uh, i landed up creating an assessment tool so uh, it was already a, a work in progress but using the uh, you know the basics of analytics that we learned and we kind of big things uh, up created an assessment tool for the did some further research landed up publishing a paper on the same got nominated for an award and managed to bag supply chain 30 under 30 in india because of that so i think that's the uh, power of you know studying uh, things from uh, i mean that's what i found really inspiring and it has kind of pushed my career in the exact direction i don't know i was not even planning for it and it happened so thank you professor for that and uh, yeah and being a supply chain consultant i'm looking forward to supply chain analytics now because that's something i want to get into and i'd say it's a beginning and it's a very nice foundation you set so thank you for that yeah thank, thank you rashmit and uh, professor there is just there is one very interesting question they say that uh, uh, blockchain if it is so good then it should be everywhere it should be uh, you know next to god if i may say so uh, there must be some something wrong with it so somebody has been inquiring this okay, what yeah. what are the drawbacks what do you feel is the problem in yeah yeah very good question see first of all i saw this question uh, why is it not adopted everywhere you have to understand the this, the point we are in the blockchain right now is like what we have were in internet in 93 so in 93 what happened we got the first web page open right and uh, then we told oh it has some value but there's a very nice video of bill gates uh, giving interview to david letterman in 95 after amazon started and david letterman says that you know uh, internet is all useless you know it is no value and bill gates tried to explain it to him and then he gives up okay he says ah, maybe it's useless although bill gates did not believe in that but why to argue blockchain is exactly in that situation we have not seen enough use cases so we are unable to visualize it but i can tell you that this is the future you know it has all the potential of everything that we could not do earlier can do there all the barcodes and all will be replaced with that so the only reason you don't see it everywhere because people are not sure whether we should put that money or not and second where to apply and where not to apply that's where you need a good understanding of nuts and bolts first and then you go and start looking at use cases that's the only roadblock we have right now we don't have something like amazon or netflix that happened to internet right internet became big when amazon and netflix came into picture in blockchain that will happen maybe one of you will start one of those companies and then everybody will see the value second thing the disadvantage well there are disadvantages first of all it requires some startup cost second uh, uh, it will require lot more uh, uh operating cost in terms of the bandwidth uh, as well as uh, energy so we have to find solution to that and third thing it requires lot of collaboration different among different supply chain partners but i will say that as a positive rather than negative see right now the supply chain partners work in isolation and that's what we saw the supply chain breakdown during the pandemic so blockchain is trying to put them it requires them to be together but it is also putting them together so our future is lot better so it is positive rather than negative uh, i will say percentage but yeah i mean uh, we have to solve lot of issues with blockchain it's not that we don't but that's what we did with internet right we had dot com burst in 99 we will have, we will have that happen with blockchain we will have some failures some success but at the end of the day we will get good results that is the point actually professor there could be one more very big uh, you know drawback of blockchain and that is its very transparency uh, because uh, in elections the world over uh, it could be so simple using blockchain and in fact there is a question also by someone that whether blockchain can be used in india uh, so it, it can become you know on a app based where you can it's like a video game uh, or a some game where you can uh, do but the problem is then no one can uh, mastermind uh, anything in the elections or make any changes uh, so Uh, do you think its greatest asset can become its biggest enemy? Is it? Uh, is it? Is there a chance? Not that... really. I, I don't believe in that. And I'll tell you, Indian election system. Somebody asked, just to let you know, the Telangana and uh, 
Andhra government is already uh, working on it, implementing it for land registry. Okay, so uh, election is there. Now in India, the bigger problem is not about the value of blockchain in election. There are a lot of pushback on that. That is going to happen for many reasons. Okay, so uh, I, I think uh, uh, we the cultural aspect is a lot bigger than the actual value. In the U.S. also same thing is happening. You know, land registry, for example, a lot of people make money out of it. They don't want to be blockchain. Uh, an election system, some people benefit from not having uh, that clean kind of system. So, uh, you know, it is transparency is there in the blockchain, but there is called pseudonymity, which means that you can hide whatever you want, you can disclose whatever you want. And blockchain can do it very nicely. So I will not take that as a negative and certainly has potential in Indian election. Actually, uh, Dubai has gone in blockchain for many, many things now, uh, but many election system around the world is looking at blockchain and they are already implementing. In fact, they did in the US in some counties already. Um, so yeah, I mean, it, it is a challenge, but I, I see the, the positives are a lot bigger than negatives. Nothing comes without Okay, it. yeah, yeah. Yeah, so one thing, Professor, I just want to bring out, I was going through uh, you know, the research that you had done and there is a very important, very nice forthcoming paper in uh, Decision Sciences, which is related to the programming method for generating new product ideas from yeah. an existing product line. Uh, okay. So I think this such a paper uh, can be a disruptive change uh, in the Indian uh, MSMEs uh, yeah. for them. Uh, what are your thoughts, sir? If you can very briefly tell us about that. Yeah, see, uh, one of the things that we are not doing enough using analytics is creating new ideas. You know, we are using a lot of analytics for improving our process, improving efficiency, and so on. But what I'm pushing now is that get all your analytics into the strategy of the company. Uh, now, it's not that companies have not done that. Uh, Amazon, Walmart, these kind of companies have done that, actually. Amazon decides which product to... Uh, put on the main screen which pro which item to sell they use analytics on that but it has not gone into the core of the companies and i think in the indian companies there's a lot of potential on that and i can tell you companies like reliance and all they are looking at it very seriously and uh, i see over time more and more companies will get into that uh, that area um, and once we get to that stage then what would happen don't think that the role of the people will go away but the role of human will be very different. I don't worry about some of the things this data can do for me, but then I have to do a lot of other things on how to manage this data and so on, how to get the right data. So if we can keep moving all our uh, analytics approach to not only improving efficiency, generating new ideas, and then getting into the strategy of the company, then the role of human will be very different. We can do more smart things that machine cannot do. Still, you know, Machine learning and deep learning is not replicating human. They are doing things more efficiently, some of the things that we cannot do, but still uh, we haven't reached to the point uh, where in the cognitive level machine can replicate us, right? So we can, we should, we should waste, we should use our energy and time on smarter things than doing something which machines can do. Okay. So I think we can do this. That's where the industry 5.0 comes, right? Man machine interface. Don't replace machine, uh, uh, the, the man's with machine or, or human with machine, but human machine interface is what is the future right now. How we can utilize a uh, machine for our benefit and use human brain to, to make that. So I, I think uh, it's clearly a lot of potential in Indian context right now. Great. And, and just shifting track, track now, Professor, I, uh, I was talking, uh, I was saying that, uh, see, one thing we really appreciate is that the way you keep changing uh, dynamically uh, the, the course content of uh, the business analytics uh, course that you teach uh, out here. And I'm sure Rashmit will, uh, you know, agree with me in that regard. Uh, so we just wanted to know, uh, especially for the, these, you know, there are uh, these hundred odd people all listening to you right now. Uh, so. Uh, what is some new exciting thing that you may be bringing to the next, uh, you know, business analytics uh, course that you will be teaching uh, at the advanced management program for operations and supply chain? See, first thing I will say, teaching business analytics or blockchain based courses is uh, good and bad. A uh, good part is that you teach the cutting edge thing. So it excites me. The bad thing is that every time I teach is a new course. 
Um, so, you know, it, it's like, I remember I had, a, I had a physics teacher whose notes used to be all yellow and, and torn. So I asked him, what is this? And he told, yeah, I, I prepared this 30 years back and you know, all, all going well, right? So, so the thing was that, uh, you know, the bad thing is that even last year things I can't use. Uh, some of the things that uh, in the analytics right now is happening is that how to deal with the newer kind of problem in analytics. And for example, the, the classic uh, models, what they do is that I give you different variables, you predict what will be my sales, what will be my demand. But a lot of service operations don't work like that anymore. See, the, what is the decision for Facebook or, um, or Google? They have to decide who will click on the ad. Or, or for example, uh, things like um, Flipkart or Amazon, whether this person will stop buying from me or not. So one part of decision is that how much this person will buy, how much will spend that we have to learn, but how to retain customers. That, those kind of decisions are called binary decision, yes, no kind of decision. And they require different kind of analysis. So I'm in my analytics course, I'm bringing more of that now. In the future batches, you will see a lot more of that because that is dealing with the, with the world of what uh, the, I will say more of what both Indian context and global context is asking. So that's the one thing of this. And second, how disruptive technologies require different kind of analytics that I'm bringing in that. Like, as I told, when, when blockchain, I, IoT are coming, there are a lot of new problems coming, how we can solve that using analytics. So a lot of that I'm bringing in my content, in fact, every year, but that is going to be a lot more going forward. Yeah, Professor, thank you. And before we close, one last question by, uh, this was a question by Vivek, uh, in which uh, uh, he is asking that why is there is a trust deficit in blockchain? And uh, maybe if I can put across one point, sir, like if I take blockchain to be the vehicle and the Bitcoin to be the passenger, is it that the passenger's notability is affecting the, you know, the reputation of the vehicle? Well, Yes and no, uh, you know, if we are a smart manager, we can dissociate that. You have to realize block Bitcoin or cryptocurrency is not blockchain. The only association between these two things is that cryptocurrency was the first application of blockchain. But when you think about JP Morgan Chase or NASDAQ or uh, Amazon, they are implementing blockchain. That's very different from uh, uh, um, Others and, and Ravi pointed out construction companies. Actually, they are they are one of the biggest in blockchain. So blockchain, the biggest companies are healthcare, retail, aerospace, and construction companies. So so the reason why why construction company, I'll give you an example so that it says. So first of all, if you are a smart executive and manager, dissociate cryptocurrency with that. Yes, it comes with that baggage, and it's a negative baggage. Although yesterday, uh, those who are following. It went all time highest, 62,000 or something, right? So I don't know what is going on with the drama. So yesterday was the highest ever in the history. So, so the point here is that dissociate all this cryptocurrency with, uh, with blockchain and think of how you will apply in your company. Construction company, for example, when, when I was building my house, this house where I'm sitting right now, we built three years back. And I had no idea what kind of material is being used in the flooring, right? Uh, which goes inside the construction. With blockchain, you can basically put all of those things. I can see where they are coming. Are they using something which is environmentally bad? Are they using something which is weak? All of that can go in blockchain. And I can see beforehand using all this augmented reality and all. So once you, once you dissociate them, I think we are in good shape. Cryptocurrency is just one part. It's nothing to do with blockchain in a manager's, in my mind, Yes, it used that vehicle and it has a bad reputation, but that's it, okay? Leave that aside, we have a lot more there. It's like you can say that internet, somebody was running uh, illegal sites, okay? Is it like that? Yeah, you can run that, right? But there are many more good things out running there. Okay, that's all you see. Absolutely, and I, I think I thank you so much for this. And uh, I really take that one word uh, of yours, and that is to really identify blockchain, you need to be a smart manager. And you can be a smart manager if you come and do the advanced management program for operations and supply chain, uh, which is starting in March. So I, uh, you know, in fact, uh, ask every one of you to come and at least see the website and apply uh, if you think that uh, this suits your business. 
so yeah so thank you very much it has been a very riveting uh, one hour we never knew where it went uh, rashmi thank you so much for you know i know you are getting into the cauldron of uh, nine days where you will be absolutely busy but you could find time to come out of it and uh, you know spend and tell us something about what you have been undergoing thank you so much avibasu as usual you have been great uh, in setting up things and getting all the audience out here and uh, professor uh, i don't know what to say to you uh, i mean you have really the way uh, it makes us feel i don't know you, you have 24 hours in a day or you have more than that sir i don't know you must be having 48 hours or something like yeah, that try to deep uh, in 30 hours there is some catch because uh, because you can't keep writing like this the way you do it's insane uh, <laughs> but anyway thank you so much for your time and i'm sure you have motivated these students uh and dear students uh, potential students let me say see this is what awaits you uh, if you take this program uh, you know cutting edge remember he is the globally the number one you know writer of research papers can you believe it and he is going to come and teach you so yeah over to you abibasu before we close uh thank you professor uh, thank you uh, kanal rajiv and thanks a lot rashmeet uh, for joining us today and taking us uh, through the sessions uh, i have pasted a link in the chat window in case if any one of you are interested to talk to us if you know just please feel free to use that link and you know indicate your preferred time to talk call we will reach out to you uh, you know in the given time so with that note i wish you all the very best and you know uh, thank you all again for joining us today wish you a very good night thank you rashmi thank and you. professor thank you thank you bye professor bye. thank you rashmi bye, bye. bye.